Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part nine. Henry or Heinrich Kunrat from the Orders of the Great Work by Manly P. Hall. Henry or Heinrich Kunrat. The name of Dr. John D. occasionally occurs in association with persons involved in the Universal Reformation. D. rescinded certain comments on his book, Manas Hieroglyphica, made by Andreas Libavius, and entered into a mild controversy with him. Libavius first attacked and then defended the early Rosicrucian manifestos. Dr. D emerged as an astronomer, alchemist, and ardent spiritist magician with a profound knowledge of hermetic mystery. Though it has been difficult to determine his correct place in the descent of the esoteric tradition, he is known also to have the acquaintance of Henry Kunrat, a mystical alchemist of distinction. Eliphas Levi refers to Kunrath as a sovereign prince of the Rosy Cross, worthy in all respects of this scientific and mystical title. Henry Kunrath, mystic and alchemist. Henry Kunrath, doctor of divinity and of medicine, an amateur de Sagis, is reported to have attained the sixth degree of hermetic initiation which brought him to the threshold of a death ship. His principal contribution to the literature of mysteries was the following. Hanover, 1609. Several phantom editions of this work are referred to by early writers. Some of these probably exist, as I have examined a copy dated 1605. The amphitheatrum opens with an argument, setting forth the seven grades of the theosophical wisdom, and Kunras' observations upon the matter of those grades are no doubt responsible for Levi's unqualified endorsement. As is usual of suspected initiates, Few particulars are available of the life and activities of Henry Kunrat. He was born in Saxony about 1555, traveled extensively, and held a doctorate of medicine from the University of Ball. In several respects, his career paralleled the eccentric pattern previously established by Paracelsus, to whose writings Kunrat was profoundly indebted, like the immortal Bombastus. The German physician was by temperament irritable and eccentric, and was given to a broad criticism of existing religious and educational institutions. Kunrath appears to have been a devout protestant, and his natural collar was considerably softened by a devotional spirit. He was initiated by a German adept named Steiner, of whom nothing is known except that he was working in 1574 and left some writings, which were edited and compiled by a later alchemist. Kunrath practiced medicine, first at Hamburg and later at Dresden. He was not especially successful as a practitioner, probably due to his disposition, and he died the 9th of September 1601 at the age of about 45 years. The amphitheatrum is said to have been among Kunrath's manuscripts and was presented to the world through the industry of his friend, Erasmus Wolfart, who added a preface. The book is remarkable for a magnificent series of engravings, setting forth the mysteries of Christian Kabbalism and alchemy. These plates were engraved in Antwerp, and several of them are dated 1602. The book presents many confusing details and suggests that it was compiled by a group with diversified resources. Certain of Kunrath's diagrams with modifications reoccur in later works claiming to have originated in the sanctum of the Rosy Cross. This mystic citizen of the Eternal Kingdom, as he has been called, was evidently familiar to Michael Meyer, and Kunrath's name has also been linked with Dukes of Brunswick, who took such kindly interest in the career of Johann Valentin Andrea. The interlocking careers of most, if not all, of the early Rosicrucian apologists stimulate reflection. Jakob Bema, the psychochemical mystic, received his illumination about the time of Kunrath's death and inherited the principal concepts with which Kunrath was concerned. 
the Hermetic Doctrine, as unfolded in the Amphitheatrum, is a kind of Christian yoga. The path of initiation begins with purification, the cleansing of the inner life, and with the realization that illumination is possible only to those who have purified their consciousness of all worldliness. The second step is a discipline for controlling the sensory perceptions and the attainment of an inner stillness, by which the human soul is rendered capable of receiving in meekness and humility the light of the eternal. The true stone of the philosopher is the transmuted and regenerated soul of man, which not only attains to its own perfection, but also can bestow itself and its powers upon other creatures. Thus the powers of the Christian soul become the universal medicine by which all impure natures attain to health and eternal life in God through Christ. Thus, the world is made flesh by the mystery of art. The hermetic elixir is truth itself which, revealed in the human heart, perfects nature. The adept is the living stone which, rejected by those who build in darkness, becomes, by the glory of God, the head of the corner. Many of the alchemists, especially those of the previous century, emphasize the physical transmutation of metals, and spent their goods in the quest of temporal wealth. Kunrath does not appear to conflict with the testimony of the great masters who preceded him, but he really emphasized a doctrine already cautiously circulated but frequently overlooked by avaricious gold makers. By this emphasis, he exposes the genuine proportions of the Albigensian heresy. These persecuted mystics taught a way of divine union. The regeneration of man and his institutions could be attained only by a symbolic resurrection. The soul, when lifted up to God by illumination, drew all other mundane things into itself. Only the perfected man could rescue his mortal institutions. Thus, in the Rosarium Philosophorum, the consummation of the great work is symbolized by the resurrection of Christ, crowned with glory who is depicted stepping from a sepulcher from which a heavy lid has been rolled away. The association of Kabbalism, alchemy, and transcendental magic with the emblems of Christian redemption did not originate in the 16th or 17th century, but was rescued at that time from the lost gnosis. The esoteric tradition emerged as the operative key to a faith which had languished for centuries in a state of general benightedness. The mysteries always operated through two parallel streams of descent. The philosophical orders emphasized the wisdom aspect of the universal mystery. The mystical orders stressed the devotional aspect. Thus, understanding and faith, identical in content, accomplished two works in one. Through understanding, the initiate overcame the illusion of worldliness, and through faith, he attended to participation in the substance of the divine. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.